only one breath. Venerable Subhato told me that he had never developed Anapanasati, mindfulness of the breath. So I said, can you be mindful of one inhalation? And he said, oh yes. End of one exhalation? And he said, yes. And I said, got it. There's nothing more to it than that. However, one tends to expect to develop some special kind of ability to go into some special state. And because we don't do that, we think we can't do Anapanasati. But the way of the spiritual life is through renunciation, relinquishment, letting go, not through attaining or acquiring. Even the jhanas are relinquishments rather than attainments. If we relinquish more and more, letting go more and more, then the jhanic states are natural. The attitude is most important. To practice anapanasati, one brings the attention onto one's inhalation, being mindful from the beginning to the end. One inhalation, that's it. And then the same goes for the exhalation. That's the perfect attainment of anapanasati. The awareness of just that much is the result of concentration of the mind through sustained attention to the breath, from the beginning to the end of the inhalation, from the beginning to the end of the exhalation. The attitude is always one of letting go, not attaching to any ideas or feelings that arise, so that you're always fresh with the next inhalation, the next exhalation, completely as it is. You're not carrying over anything, so it's a way of relinquishment, of letting go, rather than of attaining and achieving. The danger in meditation practice is the habit of grasping at things, grasping at states. So the concept that's most useful is the concept of letting go, rather than that of attaining and achieving. Maybe yesterday you had a really super meditation, absolutely fantastic just what you've always dreamed of. And then today, you try to get the same wonderful experience as yesterday, but you get more restless and more agitated than ever before. Why is that? Why can't we get what we want? It's because we're trying to attain something that we remember, rather than really working with the way things happen to be now. So the correct way is one of mindfulness, of looking at the way it is now rather than remembering yesterday and trying to get to that state again. The first year I meditated, I didn't have a teacher. I was in this little hut in Nong Kai for about 10 months, and I had all kinds of blazing insights. Being alone for 10 months, not having to talk, not having to go anywhere, everything calmed down after several months, and then I thought I was a fully enlightened person in our aunt. I was sure of it. I found out later that I wasn't. I remember we went through a famine in Nongkai that year, and we didn't get very much to eat. I had malnutrition, so I thought, maybe malnutrition's the answer, if I just starve myself. I remember being so weak with malnutrition at Nongkai that my earlobes started cracking open. When I'd fall asleep, I'd have to pry my eyelids open. They'd be stuck shut with the stuff that comes out of your eyelids when you're not feeling very well. Then one day, a Canadian monk brought me three cans of tinned milk. In Asia, there's a tinned sweetened milk, and it's so delicious. He also brought me some instant coffee and a flask of hot water. So I made a cup of this, put in a bit of coffee, poured in some of this milk, poured hot water, and started drinking it, and I went crazy. It was so utterly delicious. The first time I'd had anything sweet in weeks, or anything stimulating and being malnourished and in a very dull, tired, apathetic state. This was like high-octane petrol. Woomph. I gulped it down immediately. I couldn't stop myself, and I managed to consume all three tins of milk and a good portion of that coffee, and my mind actually went flying into outer space. Or it seemed like it, and I thought, well, maybe that's the secret. If I can just get somebody to buy me tinned milk... When I went to Wapapong the following year, I kept thinking, Oh, I had all those wonderful experiences in Nongkai. I had all those wonderful kinds of beautiful visions and all those fantastic floating experiences and blazing insights. 
and it seemed I understood everything, and I even thought I was an arahant. That first year at Wapapong, I didn't have much of anything. I just kept trying to do all the things I'd done in Nong Kai to get those results. But after a while, even strong cups of coffee didn't work anymore. I didn't seem to get those exhilarations and those fantastic highs and blazing insights that I had had in that first year. So after the first range retreat at Wapapong, I thought, this place is not for me. I think I'll go and try to repeat what happened in Nong Kai. And I left Ajahn Shah and I went to live on Pupek Mountain in Sakonakorn Province. There, at last, I was in an idyllic spot. However, for the alms round, you have to leave before dawn and go down the mountain, which was quite a climb, and wait for the villagers to come. They bring you food and then you had to climb all the way back up and eat this food before 12 noon. That was quite a problem. I was with one other monk, a Thai monk, and I thought, He's really very good, and I was quite impressed with him. But when we were on this mountain, he wanted me to teach him English, so I was really angry with him and I wanted to murder him. It was an area of northeast Thailand where there were a lot of terrorists and communists. Sometimes helicopters flew overhead, checking us out. Once they came and took me down to the provincial town, wondering whether I was a communist spy. And then I became violently ill so ill that they had to carry me down the mountain. I was stuck in a wretched place by a reservoir under a tin roof in the hot season, with insects buzzing in and out of my ears and orifices and horrible food. I nearly died, come to think of it. I almost didn't make it. But it was during that time in that tin roof lean to that a real change took place. I was really despairing, sick, weak, totally depressed my mind would fall into hellish realms. With the terrible heat and discomfort, I felt I was being cooked. It was like torture. Then a change came. Suddenly, I just stopped my mind. I refused to get caught in that negativity, and I started to practice Anapanasati. I used the breath to concentrate my mind, and things changed very quickly. After that, I recovered my health, and it was time to enter the next rains retreat. So I went back. I'd promised Achan Shah I'd go back to Wapapong for the rains retreat. And my robes were all tattered and torn and patched, and I looked terrible. When Achan Shah saw me, he just burst out laughing. And I was so glad to get back after all that. I'd been trying to practice, and what I had wanted were the memories of those insights. I'd forgotten what the insights really were. I was so attached to the idea of working in some kind of ascetic way, like I had that first year when asceticism really worked. At that time, being malnourished and being alone had seemed to provide me with insight, so that for the next few years I kept trying to create the conditions where I'd be able to have those fantastic insights. But the following two or three years seemed to be years of just getting by. Nothing much seemed to happen. I was six months on that mountain before I returned to Wapapong, deciding just to stay on and follow the insights I had had. One of the insights the first year was that I should find a teacher, and that I should learn how to live under a discipline imposed on me by that teacher. So I did that. I realized Ajahn Chah was a good teacher and had a good standard of monastic discipline, so I stayed with him. Those insights that I had were right, but I'd become attached to the memory of them. People get very attached to all these special things like meditation retreats and courses where everything's under control, everything's organized, and there's total silence. Even though you do have insight then, reflection's not always there, because one assumes that to have those insights you need those conditions. Actually, insight is more and more a matter of living insightfully. It's not just that you have insight sometimes, but that more and more, as you reflect on Dhamma, everything is insightful. You see insightfully into life as it's happening to you. As soon as you think you have to have special conditions for insight, but are not aware of that thought, you'll create all sorts of complexities about your practice. So I developed letting go. 
not concerning myself with attaining or achieving anything. I decided to make little achievements possible by learning to be a little more patient, a little more humble, and a little more generous. I decided to develop in this way, rather than going out of my way to control and manipulate the environment with the attention of setting myself up in the hope of getting high. It became apparent through reflection that attachment to the insights was the problem. The insights were valid insights, but the problem was attachment to the memory of them. Then the insight came to let go of all insights, not to attach to them, just to keep letting go of all the insights one may have, because otherwise they become memories. And memories are conditions of the mind, and if you attach to them, they can only take you to despair. In each moment, it is as it is. With just one inhalation, at this moment, it's this way. It's not like yesterday's inhalation. You're not thinking of yesterday's inhalation and exhalation while you inhale and exhale now. You're with it completely as it is, so you establish that. The reflective ability is based on establishing your awareness in the way it is now, rather than having some idea of what you'd like to get, and then trying to get it in the here and now. Trying to get yesterday's blissful feeling in the here and now means you're not aware of the way it is now. You're not with it. Even if you're doing Anapanasati with the hope of getting the result that you had yesterday, that will make it impossible for that result to happen. Once Venerable Vipassi was meditating in the shrine room and someone else was making quite distracting noises. Talking to him about it, I was quite impressed because he said he first felt annoyed and then decided the noises would be part of his practice. So he opened his mind to the meditation hall with everything in it. The noises, the silence, the whole thing. That's wisdom. If the noise is something you can stop, like a door banging in the wind and stop it, close the door. If it's something you have control over, you can do that. But you have no control over much of life. You have no right to ask everything to be silent for my meditation. When there is reflection, instead of having a little mind that has to have total silence and special conditions, you have a big mind that can contain the whole of it. The noises, the disruptions, the silence, the bliss, the restlessness and the pain. The mind is all-embracing, rather than specializing in a certain refinement of consciousness. Then you develop flexibility, because you can concentrate your mind. This is where wisdom is needed for real development. It's through wisdom that we develop, not through willpower. We're controlling or manipulating environmental conditions, getting rid of the things we don't want trying to set ourselves up so that we can follow this desire to achieve and attain. Desire is insidious. When we are aware that our intention is to attain some state, that's a desire, so we let it go. If we're sitting here with even a desire to attain the first jhana, we recognize that this desire will be the very thing that will prevent its fulfillment. So we let go of that desire, which doesn't mean not doing anapanasati, but just changing our attitude to it. So what can we do now? Develop mindfulness of one inhalation. Most of us can do that. Most human beings have enough concentration to be concentrated from the beginning of an inhalation to the end of it. But if your concentration span is so weak that you can't even make it to the end, that's all right. At least you can get to the middle, maybe. That's better than if you gave up totally or never tried at all, because at least you're composing the mind for one second. That's the beginning. To learn to compose and collect the mind around one thing, like the breath, and sustain it just for the length of one inhalation, or if not, then half an inhalation, or a quarter, or whatever. At least you started, and you must try to develop a mind that's glad at just being able to do that much rather than being critical because you haven't attained the first jhana or the fourth. If meditation becomes another thing you have to do, and you feel guilty if you don't live up to your resolutions, you start pushing yourself without an awareness of what you're doing, then life becomes quite dreary and depressing. But if you're putting a skillful kind of attention into your daily life, 
then you'll find much of daily life pleasant. That may not be so if you're caught in your compulsions and obsessions. Acting with compulsiveness becomes a burden, a grind, and we drag ourselves around doing what we have to do in a heedless and negative way. However, we have this time for a retreat. We can sit and walk. We don't have a lot to do. The morning and evening chanting can be extremely pleasant for us when we're open to them. People are offering the food. The meal is quite a lovely thing. People are eating mindfully and quietly. When we're doing things out of habit and compulsion, they become a drag. A lot of things which are quite pleasant in themselves are no longer pleasant. We cannot enjoy them when we're coming from compulsiveness, heedlessness, and ambition. Those are the kinds of driving forces that destroy the joy and the wonder of our lives. Sustaining your attention on the breathing really develops awareness, but when you get lost in thought or restlessness, that's all right too. Don't drive yourself. Don't be a slave driver or beat yourself with a whip and drive yourself in a nasty way. Lead, guide, and train yourself. Leading onwards. Guide yourself rather than driving and forcing yourself. Nibbana is a subtle realization of non-grasping. You can't drive yourself to Nibbana. That's the sure way of never realizing it. It's here and now. So if you're driving yourself to Nibbana, you're always going far away from it, driving right over it. It's pretty heavy sometimes to burn up attachments in our mind. The holy life is a holocaust, a total burning, a burning up of self, of ignorance. A diamond is a symbol of the purity that comes from the holocaust, something that went through such fires that what was left was purity. And so that's why, in our life here, there has to be this willingness to burn away the self-views, the opinions, the desires, the restlessness and greed, all of it, the whole of it so that nothing but purity remains. Then, when there's purity, there's nobody, no thing. There's just that, suchness. And then let go of that. More and more the path is just simply being here and now, being with the way things are. There's nowhere to go, nothing to do, nothing to become, nothing to get rid of. Because of the Holocaust, there is no ignorance remaining, but only purity, clarity, and intelligence.